so dangerous. No, it's so interesting. But the main one that you look is Kaya. It's so weird. I, I had no idea who it was. My mom doesn't understand. Did your mother understand the class? Yes, yeah, she liked it a lot. Oh, yay. So good. Nice. You should go by Yahid. By what? Like the one and only. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, okay, first of all, I have to apologize to everybody because I gave you incorrect information last week. I said it was Shabbos Mubarak from last week, and it was not true. Well, yeah, out, right. Right. And you know what? I, and I was like, I'm like, I woke up, I was like, how did I make that mistake? And then I realized I was talking to my mother in law. We go, we do shopping together for Pesach, and we always go the Shabbos app. We always go like the first days after Rosh Chodesh. And so I was telling her this week, and then I woke up one morning, I was like, no. I have another week before Pesach. And they're like, oh shoot, I gave the girls wrong information. So that's really, that Pesach is on my brain. So that's what happened over there. Okay. Guess what? We have a lot of things going on this week. First of all, we have a double partial. So we have a double header. It's Vayako Kukude who's going to give us a page. 517. Okay, so we're going to get to the partial in a second. We also, as I made a mistake last week, but we really have Shabbos and from this week. <laughs> Um, so for people who are going to say till them, or just we're going to talk about Shabbos Mubarak from like a little teeny bit, and um, it's also Parshas Hachaydish. It's the fourth of the four special Parshas that we we do in the lead up to Pesach. So this is the week where we get where we uh, where we read the first mitzvah that the Jews were given as a people, right? Hachaydish is Elachem, the mitzvah of keeping a Jewish calendar. Um, which was given to them Rosh Chodesh Nisan when they were in the desert. And it happens to come, it's in Parshas Bo, which is the beginning of Shemos. Uh, that's the first bit that we were given as a nation. And uh, so we read it now because now this is when it was given. It was Rosh Chodesh Nisan that they were given this mitzvah of keeping the calendar. And we've talked about it a lot, so I'm not going to talk about it again now. But really the Jewish calendar is, as Rick Margo likes to say, it's the source of Jewish schizophrenia. It's 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 how we have to have both solar and lunar working together. We're not strictly solar. We're not strictly lunar. We have to make some kind of chillin of of <laughs> steady sun, right? The sun every single day, the same. It might be cloudy, but like it's very reliable. And the moon, less so. It ups and downs. It, we don't use waxes and wanes for anything except the moon. Maybe tides, but they're connected. Mm -hmm. Right? Do we use wax and wane for anything? No. But you always say about the moon, it waxes and it wanes and it waxes and it wanes. Um, uh, what? You do. It's directly related. It's the exact same thing, right? Um, and, and the thing is, we have to be both. We have to be as exciting and fluctuating as the moon and as steady as the sun. And that's why our calendar becomes a very complicated calendar, um, as opposed to a Gregorian calendar that's strictly solar, or the Muslim calendar, which is strictly which is strictly lunar, we have to like marry the two of them together, and that becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, we talk about a lot of being in the world, being part of the world, and yet not being affected by the world. That's all part of that same conversation. So we're going to read about that this week. In we're going to read about this week. We have the second Sefer Torah that's taken out this week. So we're going to read Parshas HaChodesh. Uh, so that's the second thing that's going on. And Shabbos Varkham. Yeah, sorry. Oops, about that one. Okay, so now, oh, and a fourth thing, because if it's a double Parsha, huh? no, we do, we do it together. We have two spells because we have a Chodesh, but if we have a double Parsha, it's also Chazak. It's Shabbos Chazak this week. We're finished Chomish Shemais. So we finish part. Exactly. We have to be strong, strong, and strengthened. So we're going to have, so those are four things that we want to talk about a little bit. Some we've talked about, some we'll talk about more. But right now, let's get into our Parsha. Shani's going to say, I don't want to do the Parsha. We did it. It's repetitious. 
And you'll know that every single one of the commentators asked the exact same question. Why do we have, we're doing the Mishkan and we're doing the, the, the clothes of the Kohanim and the Kohanim Kohen Gadol. And we've literally threw with the top a part of TC. So we've done this. The only difference is that now it says, and they did it. Instead of saying they should do, it says, and they did. Um, and everybody asks, the Torah is so sparing with words. You know, mitzvahs we have, Shabbos is like a little juxtaposition. Here we got a total, total, total repetition going on over here. Um, and the question really is, um, why? What's the point of that? We're going to talk about that a little bit. If I forget, can somebody please remind me that we didn't talk about why it's all repeated? Um, I want to look at a couple of things that are going on in this week's, in the Parsha before we go into the bigger pictures. Generally speaking, we have like this. Parsha Vayakel talks, which means we spoke this a little bit. Well, we spoke about this a little bit last night. Vayakel is talking about gathering. Moshe gathers all the people together, and he starts to speak to them. And Rashi says that this is um, that it's the day after Yom Kippur. Okay, so if you just put us into context for a second, um, right? We had Revelation at Sinai. Moshe goes up the mountain for forty days and forty nights. On day 39 and change, we have the golden cat situation going on. Moshe comes down, boom, smash, re thing. Then he's going back up to try to get forgiveness. He comes back down. He's like, okay, guys, we're almost there, but not totally. He goes back up again, gets total forgiveness. And then he goes back a third time. And that's the when Hashem tells him to find, bring up stone. It wasn't exactly stone, it was sapphire. So it was like, Imagine the tablets carved out of sapphire. That's like so. So Rashi, so Rashi says that Rashi says that Hashem placed Moshe's tent over a quarry of sapphire, and he said, "In your tent, you're gonna find this." Um, and and that place of the the the, the tango, right, right. The, no, the second. I don't know. The first one were from God. The first one was from God. God got the thing, got the material, wrote the whole situation, and then those got broken. And then the second ones are made out of sapphire that Moshe has to bring up. And he comes down on Yom Kippur with the new tablets and the total forgiveness. Hashem says, which is kind of the pinnacle of Yom Kippur as well. And this happens the day after that. Okay. According to Rashi. Yeah. Yes. 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 Is that her, 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 heavy and also gorgeous gorgeous so it's interesting because some of the commentaries talk about like the, mo the whole Moshe breaking the tablet situation was that the tablets that he brought down were almost a living item and as soon as they as soon as Moshe saw what was happening it says that the letters flew back to heaven mm -hmm. and then he's left carrying heavy, heavy, heavy stone. And what happens if you're 80 years old and you're carrying very, very heavy stone, it, it dropped, it fell. So it's not like we have this image of like, boom, smash. And like, I don't know that it actually really was like that. Obviously there's different, different uh, discussion in the commentary, but the bottom line is that Vayakil is right here. It's starting here. It's the day after I'm Kippur. So there's all this stuff, all this drama that's been going on all the way uh, till now. Um, um, and, and what's interesting, uh, Rav Lichtenstein talk, talks about the idea that Vayakel denotes gathering together, right? Like a kihila is a community. So Vayakel is like, we're making a community. And what he says, which is very interesting when you think about it for a second, that Moshe and the Jewish people need to come back together again a little bit, right? Moshe is on some level going to be a little wary of the Jewish people. He had all these amazing hopes for them. We're going to leave left Egypt together. They had revelation and, and, you know, and then like he had this vision of what the people were capable of, of doing. And that didn't happen. And at the same time, 
the people are a little bit like with Moshe because what was their what was their information? What did what did they, how did they know Moshe? Miracle worker facing down Pharaoh. Da 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 da. Now what's interesting is that we the readers we know that there was a whole conversation between Moses and God after the golden calf situation, right? And God was like, what did God say? Anybody? Anybody remember? What did God say? Yeah, I'm going to destroy all those people. We're going to start again from you. We're going to just wipe it out. And Moshe fought and fought and fought. And he says, erase me from your, erase me from your Torah if that's what you want to do. And he really put himself in the lives of the Jewish people. But guess what? They didn't know that. The people didn't know that. All they know is that Moshe, miracle worker, kind, loving, facing down Pharaoh, bringing up mana, splitting the sea, goes up and comes down out of control, killing people, starting a war, smashing this calf. So they're also like a little hesitant about, about Moshe. Like there's, so this first Vayakar of Lichtenstein says is, is this coming back together of them as a unit where each of them are making steps forward. It's interesting that if you actually trace this, the Peshat text, the regular text of the Torah, Moshe never tells the people what happened up on the mountain. He only tells their children at the end of 40 years, he tells them about that experience. So they never knew that he was their warrior and their champion. They have to rebuild their relationship without that knowledge, which is a very interesting thing. So that's what's going on. Now, the first thing that Moshe is going to tell the people, I just thought it was an interesting thing, so I'm sharing that. Okay. Now, the first thing that Moshe is going to talk to people is about Shabbos. And if you look in the Hebrew, I don't know how it comes out in the English. Uh, Julian, read, read verse two in the English. Let's see what, if, if, if they... On six days, work may be done, but the seventh day shall be holy for you, a day of complete rest for the chance. Whoever does work on it shall be put to death. Okay, so in the in the English it's it's not as clear as in the Hebrew it says sheishet yamim ke ase melacha work your work shall be done not that you can do work but your work shall be done and in Hebrew which I'm not very good at and not already is very good at but we know that that is a pass ke ase is a passive terminology that there's a place of when we say ase to do that's very active ke ase is like it should be done. And really one of the things that Moshe is first of all telling the people is that, yeah, you got to do your work. You got to do, you know, you got to work your six days, blah, blah, blah. You got to put in your effort, but your attitude has to be tasse. That it's, it's done. It's already, I need to put in my effort and I need to put in my thing and I need to do my work diligently and all, and honestly, and all those kind of words. But at the end of the day, it's coming, there's a bracha from Hashem. Either I'm going to be successful or I'm not going to be successful. We all know people who are, smarter or not so smart and they're smart and their success don't necessarily seem to line up with each other that there's some place there's this bracha that comes on our work that is bigger than how much effort we put into it and that's why we have heard and we continue to hear stories and stories and stories about people who did minimal amounts of work like what was the amount of work that I needed to do in order to sustain my family and that was it they weren't like crazy i need to work 500 hours a week in order to keep up with like it, it wasn't going to make a difference you know um i once had i once had a. if you ever if you're in a taxi in israel speak to the drivers if you can speak the same language if they aren't like okay you know um and i remember i once heard a, i was once speaking to a taxi driver years ago and he was saying how like you know he's in a traditional whatever sparty traditional kind of guy and he um and and he was like you know like they're very traditional so they keep shabbat and whatever and then there was like this he was like he saw all the business that was going on on shabbat and he was like he just couldn't he couldn't like he couldn't hold himself back <laughs> so he says so one week i i i, I drove on shabbat and he's like, i made so much money like so much money and on tuesday somebody i was someplace and i'm somebody smashed my window and it was exactly the same amount of what I made on Shabbos to repair it. And then he's like, the second week he did it again. And then again, something happened to the guy's like, forget about it. I'm not waiting until it like hurts. You know, we get hurt to pay back. Or he's like, he was like, it was such a clear connection for him that he was able to see like, we need to do what we need to do. We need to do our work on, right? And I, I heard it from him. I didn't even, I'm not even making up the story. I tell you when I make up stories, but just I didn't, I heard it from him. Such a crazy story. He was like, he was like, that was it. I was thinking myself, you know, I think this is a t total random tangent, but I think that those types of 
experiences happen to people who are open to them. I, I never had such clear revelation from God. I just don't. I don't, you know what I mean? Like he, it was so clear to him. This and this don't work together. I'm going to try this. I should like, boom, no, you're not going to try it. No, you're not going to. He's like, okay, not going to. I hear you. I hear you. And I think like that place of being open to those kind of experiences um, is, is a very, in, in general in life, to be open to experiences is, lets you see them and lets you experience them. It's not like they happen more to other people than to us. I just happen to not have those experiences. I know lots of, I know some, somebody else, every time he comes to Israel, he, he has these random people telling these crazy, crazy stories of Hashgacha process. I'm like, why him and not me? Okay, so maybe I don't get out of my house enough. That's also possible. But are you, are you opening up yourself to that experience? And then that's what's going to get filled. We're going to be filled with the experiences that we let ourselves be open to. So it's very hard for my Ashkenazi skeptic self <laughs> to be totally open like that. But I'm just saying, if I could, I think it would, I think it would be, I, you, you would see, like, you know, you see it in the areas that you're, you're open to seeing and you, you do see it. And we should be blessed to see it more often. So, um, uh, Okay, so first of all, the first thing that Moshe is telling the people is that I know you're excited and I know you want to build a house for God, but you can't do it on Shabbos. Not like doing on Shabbos. In, 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 the, in the Gemara, it says that um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's here, it's right here in the Sukkim also. But what's also very interesting is that most of the things that we don't do on Shabbos are in fact done in the Mishkan and in the temple, in the, in the tabernacle and the temple. There's a lot of stuff that went on that if you were not in the temple or tabernacle, it would be considered breaking Shabbos. They slaughtered animals. They cooked the sacrifices. They played music. A lot of the stuff that go under the heading of you're not allowed to do on Shabbos, it, that's in our private homes. But in God's home, the rules are different. And the way we keep Shabbos in God's home is that we do slaughter and we do cook and we do play music, but we don't do it in our house, um, which is a, just an interesting kind of like weird thing. Weird parallel over there. Um, so they, he starts, he says, I know you're going to be excited about this, but you really, you can't do this. And now we're going to start to have the repetition of what we had before. The motion now is telling the people of the materials that they need to bring and, and the, the, all the, 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 the oh, I'm losing my, right? The, all the, the, the gems and the oils and the skins and the blah, 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 everything that you're going to do. And, um, everything that you're going to need to do for it and uh i'm just going to highlight a couple of things because basically we're gonna oh, i should keep my watch up i said wrong time. um um so another interesting thing that i saw when i was preparing in verse 10 chapter 35 verse 10 it says v'chol chacham lev bachem, all the wise of hearts in you yavo should come and should make this and make everything that hashem commanded and um the word the expression chacham lev wise of heart is actually a, an interesting expression because wise is in your head your your wisdom is in your head and your heart is where you feel emotion and so one of the things that has tells us is that you we find people who are very 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 wise but it doesn't affect their behavior and then we have people who are very 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 emotional but they're all over the place and chacham lev is, can we put those two things together? Can we take what we know and put it, the passion of our heart into it? Like not keep it cold and analytical, but to really put, put, put heart into, into what we know. And when we can blend head and heart, that's how we build the house for God. Like we have to, right? Not just, not just in Yiddish is an expression of cup mensch, you know, like he's such an intellectual and not just an emotional, you know, all over the place, but back to our chodesh, Sun and moon, we're we're blending those two things again. So it's like a theme that we're gonna we're gonna see that's going on over here. Well, in Hasidus, for sure, for sure, for sure, tells us Mayak Shalatalalev, your mind rules your heart. Okay. Um uh in but but the thing is that the heart does have a voice that has to be listened to. Um the only thing that we know about the heart is that it's it's um uh the, I'm not, I hope this doesn't come out wrong, but the heart is easily misled. It's it's um I don't know I don't manipulate it, but I I don't know, huh? 
right so i'm saying like the place the but at the same time if it's just head then it's not warm and if it's only hard it's all over the place so that's where we have chacham lev we have like that place of doing have to do both of those kind of things together um and then we have all the conversation of what's going on all the vessels blah 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 um and now we have the people who come and we have a very interesting thing so shani which is chapter 35 verse 21 and 22 so in the first Aliyah, Moshe told the people, this is what we need. And then the second Aliyah, everybody's like so excited and they want to bring all their things or their, all their donations to, to make the heart, to make the home of God. And the, the men came after the women and everybody, which we spoke about last time, people who are generous of heart, uh, who want to give, even if you don't know how or what, they all brought their stuff, the jewelry and all this kind of stuff. And they all bring all this things to Hashem. And, um, Everybody brings their stuff. And second, one second. Um, um, and we have the women in verse 25, the women of Chachmat Lev, again, that place of wise of heart in their hands. They spun, they would spin. And Rashi says over here, uh, the Tavua Sa'izim, they spun the goats that they were able to spin uh, from the goats back, the, the, the um, hairs, so that it, in Kabbalah, we know there's different levels of, Animal, vegetation, going the other way. Mineral, veg mineral, uh, vegetation, animal, human. So once you cut to here, it low it lowers the it lowers the spiritual field that it's coming from. But when you can re when you can when they can weave it off the animals, it's coming from a higher level of creation. It's coming from high, not just from Sameach. So it becomes like a more special kind of thing. Um, and uh, I'm trying to find my thing. Oh, right, there's something I want to show you, but I can't find it. One second. Oh, right, I should have marked it. Um, so they tell, oh, here we are. Okay. So then Bitsala and Oliva are in charge, and they bring all, they take all the stuff. And chapter 36, uh, verse 5 and 6 and 7. Shani, read for us. Chapter 36, verse 5, 6, and 7. Uh, okay. And they said to Moshe as follows, the people are bringing, more than enough for the labor of the work that I can put to mind to perform. Moshe Pause Moshe. a second, just a second. The they are the workers. The people who are in charge of each area of, of, uh, of the work Say to Moshe that the people brought too much, go. Moshe commanded that they should say throughout the camp, saying, Man and woman shall not do more work for the people who are in the same. And that people were restrained from dreams. But the work had been enough for all the work to do it, and they were taken. Okay, so for a second, I want to I want to focus on this, maybe because I'm a fundraiser's wife. So this is like a very interesting thing for me. That uh, that Moshe makes a building campaign, and in two days. They need to tell the people, stop bringing stuff. Do not bring. In two days, Baboker, Baboker. You see, it's got two verses before. Uh, yeah, in verse three, that he that they take it, and the people brought it, Baboker, Baboker. So the commentary tells us it took two days for everybody to bring enough. No more. Don't bring anything else. And of course, the commentators have a field day about. What does it mean and what did they bring and how did it work? So I want to sit on these cooking for a few minutes because I think it's kind of cool. Uh, first of all, I mean, the fact that that they got everything that they needed in such a short amount of time is quite impressive. Um, but it's also very interesting. Like, And, and, and the, the commentators talk about like, what does it mean that they had enough? Um, so some commentators uh, talk about the idea. The Medrash says that whatever the people brought, Hashem made it kind of stretch to feel that it was enough, you know, that it was, that it was fine. Um, some commentators talk about the idea that the people brought enough, brought a lot and the people who, the workers who were working with it, you know, sometimes like you're working on a project and you have like a very little bit of something. So you're very careful with how you work because you're afraid you don't have enough resources to do, whether it's whatever the project is. So you're like, kind of like, 
come sunny, you're kind of like a little bit stingy with how you do it. And you're not really like, oh my gosh, if I cut the material the wrong way, I'm not going to have enough. And like, can I get a reload? So, so some of the commentators say that the people gave enough that the people who were working were able to work comfortably. It turned out that there was enough, like it was fine, but it wasn't like the people didn't feel like we have to be stingy, careful with how we can, how much gold we could use, how much we could do, what we could do with it. Like it all became like, it was like, there was Shefa, there was like a lot of, it, it, there was a lot. Um, and the question of how much it was, so some of us should say that it was a lot enough that the people felt comfortable doing the work and not feeling like they have to like be careful. And the other place is uh, that they, that they whatever they brought, there was some kind of bracha on it and therefore became enough. The Archaim adds another twist to it, which I thought was very, very beautiful. He says that the people actually brought way more than was needed for the house of God, just way more. And Hashem didn't want anybody to feel that, the, you know, I need, I need 100, I don't know, make up the numbers, uh, 100 kilos of gold, and I had 150, so we only use 100. So the people who gave, everybody who's going to give is going to think, was that mine that was part of the leftovers? Like, did mine really not go into the house of God? So the Archaim, so the Archaim says that they had so much more, but Hashem kind of compressed the actual material so it all got used for the home for God, so that nobody should walk away feeling like my contribution didn't count, which I think is such a beautiful kind of way of looking at the whole situation. And then there's like, you know, then you have a question like, really, 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 why do you have to stop the people? Again, I say, okay. why do you have to stop the people? You had enough. You had enough. You're never going to need something. So you keep it on the side. You keep reserves, you know. And, and really, that's kind of the, the, one of the lessons from the house of God. Whatever you need, you have, and you need to have the shefa. But to waste it is, is momish. You, you, you can't waste. You can't just say, oh, there's extra. We're going to not have, just have it around just in case. No, if it's part of the house of God, it has to actually be used. For the house of God. If it's not for the house of God, then keep it in your house and do whatever you're going to do with it. Like, it, there's not this place of saying, oh, it doesn't really matter. And one of the other places that we're going to see it later on in another parsha, parsha is not so, when the, when the heads of the tribes bring their, their dedication to the Mishkan, it says that they brought six wagons, and because there's 12, 12, uh, there's 12 tribes, there's 12 heads of tribes. They bring six wagons and 12 oxen to carry the, the actual Mishkan. And, and the Gemara actually has a count of like how, how everything had to fit in so, so, so exactly. You know, how, how expensive is a wagon? Even if it is expensive, they're rich guys. Give a little bit more, be a little bit generous. No, 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 it's not, you're not having extra space. It all has to be like in the service of Hashem, it all has to be used. So every inch of space on the wagon has to be used because it's for Hashem. It's not like, oh, just random floating around, you know, doing nothing, being nothing. It's part of the house of God. It's purposeful. It's meaningful. It's there for a reason. It's not just kind of like, oh, we'll find a purpose for it somehow. No, that's not how it works. And that's why they actually had to stop the people. Not to say you aren't generous, not to say that you don't want to give, but to say, wait a second, it's the house of God. Do we need it here? If not, then, it, then its purpose isn't here. We don't need to just hang it here and let it hold, you know, hang it over here until we someday find a purpose. Either it has a purpose or it doesn't. And I want to go out on a limb and say that the same is true for each and every one of us. But we have talents and we have abilities and we have whatever, it, all, all the parts that make us up, it all has to come into our service of Hashem. However it is that we enact that service, everything that we have, there's nothing that we're just like, oh, that. That's not so important. That doesn't really count. That's just like my side little, you know, whatever. Everything that we have and everything that we are really needs to be involved in our service of Hashem. Our service of Hashem is not only davening and keeping Shabbos, but as we live our lives as Jewish powerful women in 2021, it's all part of it. And we have to really be able to take stock of who we are and what we are and say, am I using this for Hashem? Am I being purposeful in my in my talents and in my abilities and in my time and in my finance, like everything really, it's, it's a little bit stressful because like we don't always want to live purposefully, you know, because when you're living purposefully all the time and accounting for your time and, and it's a little bit stressful. But I want to say that downtime is also part of our time. 
like when we say I need to have downtime, um, then that is also part of staying healthy, healthy people in order to serve Hashem. And I think that my last rant with Margaret's rant on the side, if our downtime involves any form of social media, we should set a timer because or else we will fall down the rabbit hole of social media, wake up 10 hours later and wonder where our day went. So that's the end of my rant on that subject for today. Okay, so this is it. So the people, so they brought everything, they had whatever they needed, and now we're going to continue to go, and it's going to talk about the stuff that we saw in Turum and Tatave, and they are going to actually make the curtains, and they are actually going to make, and make, and make, and make, so we're going to, we're going to not go into that so much. Um, the one interesting thing, which is there, which I think is just in the, in the practical, logical part of building a home for God, when Hashem gives the commandments, and that Moshe hears it the first time, in Turim and Tetzave, we have all the articles. First, we have the Aaron and the Menorah and all those kind of things. And afterwards, it talks about the boards and the things and blah, 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 all that stuff. When they actually make it, they do it reverse. They make the building and then they make the vessels. And when Moshe comes to the tile and said, why did you do it this way? So he says, it's logical. You, where are you going to put the stuff? You don't make furniture and then make a house. You know, where are you going to put the, we're going to put the ark if you don't have a house to put the ark you just make the ark and let it sit in the middle of the desert and Hashem actually says that Bitzalel, his name is Bitzel Kel, well God's name right, that he's as if he was in the shadow of God, that he knew what Hashem wanted, even though that wasn't what Hashem articulated, like the, the place of using our logic and using our, does this make sense um, Bitzalel is like it has to make sense as well. So the house of God has to make sense. It's not just like, oh, we'll just like throw everything around the desert and hope we find a little piece of No, no, no. Like we're going to make a structure. And so this, in these parshas, you're going to find that first they made the curtains and first they made the planks and blah, 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 and the sockets. And then they made all the stuff. Um, and we are, believe it or not, we are going to, okay. And then we're going to go into Parshas Pekude. Parsh Bakude is char, starts in chapter 38, verse 21. And this is where Moshe gives an exact accounting of every single cent that came into the Mishkan and where it got used. Okay. When you talk about transparency and, and where does where do things go and how do things work, Moshe is the first one. I mean, this is Moses. And still he had to tell the people, we brought in this much gold. This is how much went into the menorah and this kind of thing. And you, everything equals up and everything really like works well together. And he is able to account for everything. Um, and then over here, one second. Uh, I want to find it. Um, okay, so over here in verse, uh, in verse, um, uh, chapter 38, he's counting the silver, what he did with it, right? He says, these are the, whatever, the, the hundred key car of Kesef that we used, da, 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 da. and the next verse says, but the, 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 can, the cancellation on the elef is an up, the, the 1,750 um, amount, whatever the amount is, like, I think it's like shekel amount, they made hooks for the, for the, to hang the curtains on. And, um, and Chassidus talks about the idea that, that there was a place when Moshe silver went. And that's why there's like, it's like, you know, when you're thinking and you're like going up a second and, uh, that that thousand seven hundred and fifty, oh yeah, no seventy five, a thousand seven hundred and seventy five, yeah. Somebody, verse twenty eight, yeah. Chapter thirty eight, verse twenty five. a thousand seven hundred and seventy five, right? So what I think it's probably like a shekel amount. It's not. It's not tons of it. They made hooks for the curtains on the outside of the cur of the of the uh, courtyard. And, and Hasidus talks about that there was a place that for a second Moshe forgot about those hooks. And, and really every single part of the Mishkan reflects us and a part of us. And there is, you know, what's a hook? The thing that you hang, you hang something on, right? It, it, in the letter Vav in Hebrew is actually, a hook is called a Vav. 
because it's shaped like a hook. It hangs, something hangs on it, right? So Hebrew, look a letter, look the letter vav. So a hook in Hebrew is a vav. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, look inside. It's a asa vavim la amudim. We did, we made hooks for the pillars. We did, we made hooks for the pillars. Okay, so so you know, on an emotional place, you know, the hook. Similar to like the bells at the bottom of the of the pre, it's something that's hanging on. It's not solid. It's not a pillar. It's not. It's not the socket. It's not the curtain. It's like a hook. It's like a little thing, and it's at the edge, and something's hanging off of it. And there was a place where Moshe forgot about that, and and where we have to understand that there are parts of us. They're like our hooks. They're not the main thing of who we are. They're not the main stay. They're hanging on to something and something's hanging off of it and they're also part of the house of god our personal house of god those hooks that we want to discount are also very important and also very significant and we can't ever forget that those are part of our house of god and how do we bring them in oh that's what we did with that it's over there it's 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 uh it's it's part of it's part of us it's it's not our main it's not our solid it's not our whatever but it is very much part of who we are because it's relying on something and something is relying on it. That's that's the word of the hook. Okay. And so he gives a thing, and we he really only gives an exact accounting of the gold, the silver, and the copper, which we understand. He doesn't say exactly how much red we brought in, how much linen, how much wool, but he basically says this is what we use it all for. And the end of the the end of the parsha, we have them actually, we're gonna have the clothes of the Kaibgadal. And the end of the parsha, we have how they brought everything to Moshe. And how they put the whole thing together. So we're taking everything and we're now putting up the walls and we're putting up the curtains and we're putting the vessels in. And just to go all the way till the end of our parsha for a second, Julian, I see I'm gonna come back to you in a second. Um, and what happens at the end? At the end, if you look at Mach here, which is chapter 40, verse 34, they put everything, they uh, in 33 it says that they pick. They put everything up, they pick the the, the, chaser, the courtyard and everything, and they put everything in the curtain, and then the cloud of the covers the whole covers the whole Jamie read for us 34. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Hashem for the tabernacle. Keep going. Uh, Moshe could not enter the tent of meeting, the tent of meeting, but the cloud rested upon it, and the glory of Hashem for the tabernacle. When the cloud was raised up from the tabernacle, the children yeah. Uh, the children of Israel would embark on all their journeys. The cloud did not rise up, they would not embark until the day it goes up. For the cloud of Hashem would be on the tabernacle, tab tabernacle by day, and the fire would be on it at night. Before the eyes of all of the house of Israel throughout the world. And what's everybody going to say? Chazak, chazak, mini chazak. So here we finish our Chomish. Our, fin our Chomish finishes, we put the whole thing together, and on one level, there's a place that even Moshe can't walk in. It's covered with the cloud and they he can't actually get in. It's going to happen in another parsha. They actually are able to get into the into the Mishkan and do the service. But the parsha finishes off that the cloud of Hashem guides us wherever it is that we're going. When it's in place, we stay in place. When it lifts up, we move. And and I think it's such a such a, a real thing for us that our parsha finishes off the Chol him with all their journeys. We we are the you know the, the the wandering Jew is a is a truism, and wherever we go and wherever we are, we have to understand two things: a we're there for a purpose, and b Hashem is always with us, even when we don't necessarily feel it and we don't necessarily understand it. And we don't know why are we where we are now. This wasn't where I was headed. This wasn't where I was planning to be. But this is where I am right now. And how do I deal with that? We have to understand. A, that it is being led by Hashem, whether we see the cloud or not. And B, he's always with us. And he's always there to protect us and to guide us and help us. And that's going to be, and, and on that we say, chazak, chazak, chazak. on that we say that we should be strong and we should be strong and we should be strengthened. That there's this place that I think it's so important for us to remind ourselves of those truisms. That wherever we go and whatever we do, Hashem is with us and we're there for a purpose. And my, my bracha to us at this point is, that if we make it to Shoal, the big if, I know, but every single Shoal is going to shout this out, Chazak, Chazak, it is a blessing for each and every one of us 
to be strong and to be strong and to be strengthened. And can we think for a second before that happens, how do I want to tap into to that energy? How do I want to tap into that blessing that's being poured on me from all the people wherever I am? You know, my no shul is going to be loud and boisterous. Even the most calm shul, they're not going to be calm. Um, and they're blessing each and every one of us. And if we could say, in this one area of my journey, I want to have the blessing of Hazak. I want to have that blessing of being strengthened by everybody. Think about it beforehand. And then when we all shout out Hazak, understand that that's a blessing that's directed directly at you and that you should be able to feel the bracha of the community in the area that you are choosing to work forward in your relationship with Hashem. Juliana, you had a question or a comment? Um, every time that so much for gold and star with the gold. Is it always where it's like uh, twisted with gold? Gold, gold, gold. Every time? Mm, I don't know. Because there are certain garments like the, the me'il of the of the coin gadol, which is only turquoise. I think it's only turquoise. But I think when I think that whenever they're listed as a combination, that these are the threads that are used, then they are always that with the gold and twisted together and you know as as the, that beautiful kind of uh, kind of situation going on over there. Um, questions, comments. So do we get something new in the parsha? We got a little bit something new. Oh, wait a second. Why do we have it repeated again? We didn't we have a few minutes. I want to talk about that for a second. So why do we have the whole thing repeated again? Um, you know, uh, why the whole, why is Vayako Pukude repeated again? Oh, I want to say one more thing before I say that. Okay, one more thing before I say that. We spoke about this a little bit yesterday about Vayakel being the gathering and Pukude being the count, right? Sure. That Vayakel symbolizes the community, Pukude symbolizes the individual. But what's very interesting is that both Torah portions actually have both. That in the in Parshish Vayakel, you also have see, the enumeration of all the different vessels. And in Pukude, you also have taking all those individual things and making it into one home for God. And in the conversation of individuality versus community, I think it's very important to stress the fact that both are very important and they work together. Meaning I'm not an individual for the sake of me being an individual. I'm an individual for the sake of being part of a community. And a community isn't just, an, how do you pronounce it? An amorphous? Amorphous, A M O R P H, and amorphous, like a, huh? I think Juliana's gonna know how to pronounce everything. I don't know why. No shape, maybe. A M O R P H. I think, I don't know, one of those words. What I'm saying, the, okay, well, we're gonna figure out what the word is because it's a good word. But the idea of a community just being like a chulun, like everybody goes in and we all like, yeah, one like, one like, huh? I said chulun. I said chulun. Yeah, no, 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 right? What's a chulun? Where everybody contributes, everybody contributes, but like you really can't pick everybody out. You can't pick out, pick out the details of, of what's going on over there. Is that what a community is meant to be? And Terry tells us no. Yes, yes. So how do you pronounce it? Oh, I was right. I was right. Amorphous. I was right. Yes. Score. I was right. Um, so, so community isn't only meant to blur all our edges and say, I don't have my own individual anything. Um, but there is a place where community is a binding place and a place of security and a place of togetherness. Um, Yes, but the place where like the community says, let's all be a chulin, and it doesn't matter what you really are, that's where we say, no, 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 that's not the point. That there's a place where I, as an individual, have something to contribute individually, not because like, oh, I need my name in life, and I'm so famous, and I'm going to be so amazing, but yeah, I have something specific to contribute to the, to the conversation of community. I have something different than somebody else has to, has, to, has, to, has to offer. And if I try to do yours and you try to be mine, neither of us do it successfully. But to understand that, that the interplay of both of them are very important and both really contain both of them. But, and this is what I said last night, but I'm going to repeat it again. Where do we start? 
where do we start? Do we start with making myself the best possible me that I could be? No, we start with a vayakta. We start with saying, let's be a unit. Let's be a team. Let's get together. Let's be, let's build together. And each and every one of us have to do something um, special and specific within that. We don't need everybody doing the same thing. Like that, that's not what it is. It's really maybe not, we're not, we're not supposed to be a uh, chalant. I think we're supposed to be an orchestra. Lots of different instruments, every single one playing, you know, their part. And I, I'm not so good with music, but they say about a conductor who once was listening to a, uh, somebody else conducting an orchestra and he heard that one of the violins was missing. How many violins are usually in an orchestra? Like so many, right? But the conductor was able to hear that one of the violins was missing. And really that's what we're supposed to be. We're all supposed to be individuals playing our, not, not saying I need to be that, but to say who I am. And if I'm not who I am, then even if I'm a violin or the triangle, I was wondering, like you actually went to school to learn how to do a triangle thing. <laughs> um, I think so. Um, uh, generally you did percussion. So and then that included all, all those fun little instruments. So they have the shake, shake, shake and the triangle. Mm -hmm. I hear it. Um, I probably could have done those, but I didn't, not, whatever. Uh, but really that's what we're supposed to do. We're really supposed to be our instrument in the bigger orchestra. And if somebody says, no, you have to be part of our challenge, tell them you got it wrong. That's not who I am. That's not what I'm doing. Um, so I want to give us a bracha that we, we get who we are understand who we are, understand the power that we have as individuals and as part of a collective. And how do we put those things together back to our sun and moon? How do we marry those different parts of us, that place of my individuality, my passion, my ability and the needs of the community? And how do we put all those together? Understanding that both are important, but each one on its own is not, does not have an intrinsic value on its own because each Parsha has bits of both. So it's not like, oh, there's only community and there's only individuality and sometimes we get together. No, each Parsha has parts of both and we gotta put them all together and, and, and make something bigger and more beautiful for ourselves and for the rest of the world. Um, so that is my thought. Have an awesome rest of the day, okay?